good afternoon. I'm going to speak on the general subject of them on us. In other words, how did the major Western powers, the Anglo-American powers, the ABC powers, America, Britain, and Canada, view the question of Ukrainian independence, regard the Ukrainian-Canadian community? First thing that I want to mention to you is that the archives on Ukrainian subjects are voluminous. I was astounded at the sheer volume of material that can be found in the British Foreign Office records, in the Office of the State Department, in External Affairs, and in various other archives, including more recently, I just returned from Rome, in the Vatican Secret Archives. It's an enormously impressive collection of material, which includes a great deal of unmined information about Ukraine and Ukrainians in the diaspora. Now, why should we bother to do this kind of study? I think my colleague, Professor Vietrovich, has already suggested the answer to you. It is that we often believe that those who do not learn their history are doomed to repeat it. So let me take that as a starting theme. What are the general lessons that I have learned over the course of the last 25 years or so of archival research and the kinds of repositories that I've just mentioned to you? The first lesson learned was that the Anglo-American powers never wanted nor felt they needed a free Ukraine. And that includes Canada, I'm ashamed to say. The ABC powers never wanted nor felt they needed a free Ukraine. I think that goes against the grain of what most of us thought was true, namely that Canada, the United States, Britain, the West in general, was sympathetic to the cause of Ukraine's national independence. It wasn't, and I'll prove that to you in a few moments. When you review the documentation, and it is voluminous, one often finds evidence of ignorance about Ukrainians, indifference to the Ukrainian cause, and sometimes even outright hostility toward it. One finds considerable evidence of our community being placed under surveillance, our community being managed by the powers that be, our community rarely being able to get more than tokenism from various government officials, and indeed, in some cases, our community has been molded, has been shaped through direct strategic surgical interventions, all of which I'll prove to you in a moment. Let's start with the question of ignorance. In February of 1939, the Second World War had not yet begun, the government of Great Britain tasked a group within the British Foreign Office, Department of Overseas Trade, to describe the economic assets of Ukraine and the probable effects of an independent Ukrainian state on both the economies of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. In other words, the question put to, to the analysts was, if Ukraine were to become independent, what impact would that have on Nazi Germany, on the Soviet Union? They concluded that it would be fatal to the Soviet Union to lose Ukraine. And I think that is a conclusion that uh, echoes forward into the present day. But as they were discussing the economics, and we can't go into those today, they wrestled with another more fundamental question, and this may surprise you. They wrestled with the question of, what is a Ukrainian? Now, we're sitting here, each one of us in our own way, regardless of our immigration or generation or the region of Canada or of Ukraine that we come from, we all know who we are. But in 1939, the British Foreign Office, at the pinnacle of its power, at the pinnacle of its intelligence gathering capabilities, wrestled with the fundamental question of what is a Ukrainian? And here are the definitions they came up with, which I suggest to you reflect a rather jaundiced perspective. Ukrainians, I quote, are of artificial origin without any real claim to race distinction and are in fact, I love this, a collection of magnificent crossbred scallywags. That's the British Foreign Office. Dealing with Ukrainian leaders, among them Kay Kisilevsky, who subsequently immigrated to Canada, the British Foreign Office decided that when dealing with Ukrainian representatives, we must, quote, bear in mind that they are only just now emerging from the status of semi-intellectual and be, again, an odd 
thing, have a decidedly oriental kink in their brains. So those are the kinds of, I think, racially prejudiced commentaries that we saw about Ukrainians and even what is Ukraine. Now, why should that have any importance? The bigoted remarks of a few British Foreign Office officials because, of course, after the Second World War, when literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Ukrainians found themselves in the displaced persons camps of Western Europe, the same British Foreign Office officials, Canadian officials, and American officials, and French officials, charged with the forcible repatriation of many of these people as Soviet citizens back to the USSR, had to wrestle with the question of who is a Ukrainian? Is this a stateless person? Is there such a person as Ukrainians? Where do we send them? What do we do with them? So you see, these kinds of prejudices, in fact, inform policy, policy that had disastrous results for literally hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians forced to return to the Soviet Union against their will, and in some cases to their death, including, including many witnesses to what was arguably the greatest genocide of the 20th century in Europe, the whole of the war. The Western powers gave the Soviets, gave the perpetrators back those who could have borne testament to what happened during the whole of the war. Keep that in mind. Now let's talk another issue, the issue of the whole of the war, which I've just addressed. Indifference to the whole of the war as a great catastrophe. We know that in October of 1933, a group that styled itself as the Ukrainian National Council in Winnipeg wrote a letter to Ramsey MacDonald, and the same letter, by the way, was sent to the US Department of State, talking about the whole of the war, although they didn't use the term at the time. Now, I'm just going to read to you a bit of this letter because I think it touches on a number of rather important points. Writing to Ramsey MacDonald, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, the Ukrainian National Council said as follows. We are taking the liberty of directing your attention to the deplorable fact that for a considerable time, the population of eastern Ukraine, now under Bolshevik military occupation, has been systematically starved by the Moscow authorities. The tragedy of the Great Famine of 1921-22, when nearly 10 million people died from hunger, is being repeated, but in all probability on a still larger scale. Thousands of letters are being received in Canada continuously containing gruesome details of the vast number dying. There are settlements in Ukraine where only one-third, sometimes only one-fourth, of the original population are still alive. Crop failure is not the reason for this famine. The reason for this famine is the brutal policy of the Moscow rulers who need ingredients for export to balance their budgets, pitilessly take everything from the farmers who have already been proletarized. Especially in Ukraine, where the peasants are opposed to foreign Russian rule, they are being deprived of literally everything, being left without the, even the smallest ration of food for their daily meals, under the excuse that they are hoarding or hiding food. With such tactics, even a bumper crop of huge yield could not save these people from starvation. So in October of 1933, Ukrainians in Winnipeg could write to the Prime Minister of Great Britain and tell him in some considerable detail of what was happening. You might think that the world's superpower of the time would react in a positive way, but in fact, they did nothing. They covered up the famine. And why did they do that? We have an archive that tells us the exact answer. Lawrence Collier wrote in 1934, the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter is that, of course, we have a certain amount of information about famine conditions, similar to what has already appeared in the press, and there is no obligation on us not to make it public. We do not want to make it public, however, because the Soviet government would resent it, and our relations with them would be prejudiced. But, of course, we cannot give that explanation in public. The British government knew about the whole of the war and covered it up. Interventions. In which way did the Anglo-American powers see that they could somehow use Ukrainian nationalists for their own purposes? Well, this comes out most perfectly in 1941. Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union are still allies until June 22, 1941. 
As the British, their backs up against the wall, the Battle of Britain has been joined, Western Europe has been overrun by the Nazis, the Soviet Union is acting in a positive, collaborative manner with Nazi Germany. As the British are looking around in desperation for anyone to help them that they can, they decide that they want to use the Ukrainian nationalists to create tension, to create an insurgency on the boundary line between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in the East. RMN Henke writes, if the Ukraine goes off at half cock before we are ready, the whole thing may fizzle out. Or if it succeeds, the Germans will just take over the whole Ukraine. Unless I am wrong, we in Britain don't want a Ukrainian revolt before the summer of 1941. And then we will use it to down the Russians and the Germans together. Unfortunately for our British policymakers, Nazi Germany invited, invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1941, and the prospects of the British inciting a revolt in eastern Ukraine in Halychina uh, was therefore forestalled. Now, of course, this created policy problems for the West in general. Between September of 1939 and June of 1941, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were allies. In Canada, that meant that those who advocated in favor of the Soviet Union found themselves in political disfavor. And organizations like the Ukrainian Labor Farmer Temple Association, the Communist Party of Canada, which had all supported the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement, found their leaders confined, interned, their properties confiscated. Suddenly, overnight, it all changes. On the 22nd of June, the Soviet Union is invaded. Joseph Stalin becomes Uncle Joe and our ally and the Canadian government has a major problem on its hand. We've just finished interning those people and now there are allies here in Canada. No less than Lester B. Pearson, who would become subsequently a Prime Minister of Canada, wrote as follows. True, Russia did not enter this war to help us, but defend only herself. True also that the sudden discovery by the communists here in Canada that the war is not imperialistic, but holy, is somewhat nauseating. But the fact remains that whatever the reasons may be, the Russians are now fighting on our side, and the communists have become ardent propagandists for an all-out war effort. And so the ULFTA, the AUC, and the organizations on the Ukrainian-Canadian left got back their halls, their leaders were released from jail, and the Ukrainian-Canadian Committee, which had been created by the government of Canada only a few months before, was thrown out. And we'll come back to that in a moment.